esters contain an alkoxy group, OR, directly connected to a carbonyl group. And with esters, we're beginning to get into territory where the heteroatomic group linked to the carbonyl carbon is not that great of a leaving group, right? O minus is not that great of a leaving group. So esters are more limited in the kinds of nucleophilic acyl substitution reactions that they can do. On the other hand, we've already seen two ways to make esters from acyl chlorides and acid anhydrides. And so they're, um, they can be prepared that way. There's also a third approach used to prepare esters from alcohols. We'll touch on in a second. And there's the SN2 reaction of carboxylate nucleophiles, which is probably the least common method employed, but a method that works great. So the idea of this SN2 reaction is, well, I can start with a carboxylic acid or a carboxylate. I can generate the carboxylate by treating the carboxylic acid with sodium hydroxide and then treat with a primary or methyl electrophile such that an SN2 reaction occurs. The nucleophilic O- displaces a good leaving group. Here it's iodide and we make an OC bond, which turns the ultimately carboxylic acid starting material into an ester. Because this is an SN2 reaction, it is necessary that the um, electrophile be a primary or methyl carbon, but aside from that limitation, this is a fantastic way to make esters. Probably the most common approach that's used to make esters in practice uses a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, because both of these starting materials are quite frequently very, very cheap. And the, resulting, the result on the product side is an ester and water. And if we take a minute and think about the thermodynamics of this reaction, which side is favored, we'll, we'll realize that there doesn't seem to be much of a driving force on one side or the other. On the left, we have an alcohol nucleophile. On the right, we have a water nucleophile. And alcohols and water are very similar in acidity and basicity, very similar in pKa. So there doesn't seem to be a driving force one way or the other in this reaction. We do a couple of things to deal with this. First of all, we use an acid catalyst. This accelerates the reaction by protonating the carbonyl oxygen, as we'll see when we discuss the mechanism of this reaction in detail here shortly. We use an excess quite often of the alcohol, although if the alcohol is a precious material, we can also use an excess of the carboxylic acid. We use an excess of that reactant to drive the reaction toward products. We can also remove the water product through some kind of experimental means. And doing both of these things really draws on Le Chatelier's principle, where using excess reactant and getting rid of product to pull the reaction toward the product side, toward the ester side. And this is necessary because there's no intrinsic driving force for the reaction the way there is in, for example, treatment of an acyl chloride with an alcohol, which is alluded to up here. This works great because Cl- minus is a fantastic leaving group relative to the alcohol nucleophile. Not so in the bottom here, so we have to use excess alcohol or excess carboxylic acid to really drive this reaction toward the products. This reaction of carboxylic acids with alcohols to produce esters and water in the presence of an acid catalyst is known as Fischer esterification, and it's a really instructive reaction mechanism involving acid-catalyzed nucleophilic acyl substitution. And so the acid catalyst is going to do what we've seen acid catalysts do with carbonyls many times already in the course, protonate the carbonyl oxygen. This makes that carbonyl carbon a much better electrophile, and now is a good chance to pause and draw an alternative resonance form of this protonated carbonyl intermediate that shows this. At this point, the alcohol nucleophile can get involved and add to the carbonyl carbon. This produces kind of a protonated tetrahedral intermediate that loses that proton, the conjugate base of the acid catalyst plucks it off, and we end up at a neutral tetrahedral intermediate here. Now, everything to this point is reversible because we haven't really moved, for example, positive charge from a less stable to a more stable location at this point. Everything is reversible, but we're driving it by using it, for example, in excess of the alcohol. At this point, one of the OH groups gets protonated. This sets up a water leaving group in that tetrahedral intermediate and a beta elimination step occurs to give a protonated ester intermediate. Deprotonation of that ester gives the neutral product. And notice a molecule of water was given off in this beta elimination step. So this is kind of a hefty 
mechanism, but it draws on proton transfer, nucleophilic addition, and beta elimination, these three key elementary steps that we've seen throughout this unit. The other thing I would draw your attention to is that from a bird's eye view, this mechanism involves two stages. Acid catalyzed nucleophilic addition, that's the first three steps, proton transfer, the nucleophilic addition business occurs, and then a proton comes off, and then acid catalyzed beta elimination. The catalyst puts a proton on the leaving group, beta elimination occurs, and then a proton is removed from the resulting product. And so we can think of it as occurring in two phases, acid-catalyzed nucleophilic addition and acid-catalyzed beta elimination. And all the steps are reversible. What's really driving this is the use of an excess of the alcohol and, in some cases, removal of this water byproduct in the beta elimination step. At the start of the video, we alluded to the fact that esters don't have a great leaving group linked to the carbonyl carbon, so they don't have a ton of practically useful substitution reactions. They're sort of limited in what they can do here. But under basic conditions, they are susceptible to hydrolysis back to carboxylic acids. And the base promoted hydrolysis of esters is called saponification. It has this name because the carboxylate salts that were generated um, were used and, and continue to be used as soap. Saponification comes from the idea that the resulting products, if we leave them as the carboxylate salts, are soap. So the reaction involves treatment with, for example, sodium hydroxide in water. This causes base catalyzed hydrolysis. Now, a base promoted hydrolysis, the reaction is not catalytic, as we'll see here in a second. And, this, and the second step is addition of H3O+, addition of an acid. And this is necessary to protonate the carboxylate if we want the neutral carboxylic acid out of the reaction. All right, let's talk about the mechanism here. Well, this is a base promoted nucleophilic acyl substitution, and hydroxide is basic enough to add in to the carbonyl carbon, at least reversibly, to produce an alkoxide intermediate. At this point, we can beta eliminate the OR2 minus group, and this is, again, still reversible, right, because we've just moved negative charge from an O minus at the start to an O minus at the end. No profound structural driving force here. The driving force comes in in the next step, when OR- deprotonates this carboxylic acid, actually intermediate, and the final product we end up with before the acid addition is the anionic carboxylate, as well as the neutral alcohol, R R2OH, right, the conjugate acid of this base right here. If we want the neutral carboxylic acid, we've got to treat that carboxylate with acid, and this protonates the carboxylate to make uh, the carboxylic acid. And just to hit on this one more time, what really drives this reaction is this irreversible proton transfer step, this extremely favorable proton transfer from an alkoxide, uh, from, a, from a carboxylic acid to an alkoxide, generating a carboxylate much more stable than OR2-, as well as the neutral alcohol. If we can make an ester from a carboxylic acid and an alcohol with water as a product, it makes sense that if we use an excess of water and an acid catalyst, we should be able to convert an ester back to the carboxylic acid. And this is the idea behind the acid-catalyzed hydrolysis of esters. This reaction is essentially the microscopic reverse of Fischer esterification. It involves all the same elementary steps, but occurring in reverse, with reverse electron flow. So notice here that rather than starting with the carboxylic acid and say an excess of alcohol, we're starting with an ester and using an excess of water as well as an acid catalyst to generate the carboxylic acid and HOR2. So this is a way to get water to displace the alcohol in a nucleophilic acyl substitution reaction in the sense, getting us back to a carboxylic acid. And the mechanism here has the same two sort of bird's eye view stages as Fischer esterification. First, there's an acid-catalyzed nucleophilic addition stage, and then there's an acid-catalyzed beta elimination stage. So that first nucleophilic addition stage, we put the proton on. The business step of nucleophilic addition occurs. We can see the curved arrows for that right here. And then a deprotonation occurs to get this tetrahedral intermediate. In the second stage, a proton goes on to OR2, the OR2 oxygen, preparing to beta eliminate this alcohol. And then after that beta elimination, we remove a proton from the resulting product, and the result is the neutral 
carboxylic acid. And here again, to really drive this, because all the steps are reversible, we use an excess of water now, and in some cases, remove the alcohol. For example, if it's got a relatively low boiling point, we can think about removing that alcohol via distillation, for instance. It is possible, at least theoretically, to convert an ester into an amide, since the amine nucleophile is a better nucleophile than the alcohol product. However, this reaction is rarely used in practice because it's much easier to start with a carboxylic acid and use peptide coupling to synthesize an amide. So it's, it's actually easier and sometimes even higher yielding to convert the ester back to a carboxylic acid and then use peptide coupling with an amine nucleophile to get the amide. So this is not a common uh, reaction, the synthesis of amides from esters. We treat an ester with lithium aluminum hydride, we reduce it all the way down to a primary alcohol, and we've seen this reaction previously. Two equivalents of hydride are added to the organic substrate here. If we want partial reduction of the ester just to the aldehyde, we can use dibal H at low temperature, negative 78 degrees C. And that low temperature is actually critical. If you raise this up to room temperature, this will reduce all the way to the primary alcohol. So you gotta watch out for that. Like acyl chlorides and anhydrides, esters react with Grignard reagents and organolithium reagents twice, two equivalents of the organometallic react, to yield alcohols, tertiary alcohols containing two copies of the same group. This reaction occurs via a ketone intermediate. So here I want to look at the mechanism actually in detail to clarify where this ketone intermediate comes in and to show us that this is really just an instance of nucleophilic acyl substitution followed by a nucleophilic addition of an organometallic to a ketone process that we've already seen. So in the first step, we have nucleophilic addition of the nucleophilic R3 group to the carbonyl carbon. This generates an alkoxide intermediate, which we see right here, and this can eliminate, at least reversibly, the alkoxide to give a ketone intermediate. But at this point, that ketone is even more reactive toward the Grignard reagent than the starting ester because the ketone is more electrophilic than the starting ester. And so a nucleophilic addition process can occur here again to give us an alkoxide intermediate derived from a tertiary alcohol. And upon workup, we add water, water transfers a proton to the alkoxide, and we end up with this neutral tertiary alcohol product in which we get two copies of the Grignard's organic group added to the organic substrate via a substitution process first and then an addition process. So this occurs with both Grignard reagents and with organolithiums and this mechanism also applies to the acyl chloride and anhydride reactions analogous to this that we've seen previously.